Welcome! Read A Course in Miracles along with us in our Home Style text class. For information about our live workbook classes, email us and check out our website for more course support, including retreats at the Little Garden in Sedona. All okay. right. So what are you doing today? Today we're doing Chapter 13, Section 3, The Fear of Redemption. There is some awesome, awesome stuff in here. And we were talking about how, how this builds on last week. Yeah. So remember last week was telling us that we make up all these ego ideals. Yeah. And it's like, I got to do this. I should do that. I, I, I was so wrong when I did this or that. And they're all baloney. And these ego ideals, just kind of keep that in mind, are only covering up a deeper sense of guilt that deeper sense of guilt that we murdered god's son yeah that we ran away from god ran in other words yeah. that we're yeah yeah okay so let's see how this book talks about it how this, this section magnificent section this is a fabulous section so the first part is talking about you working with your own sense of yourself your mind and then it shifts into your brother, working with your brother. So All right. let's, let's go. So let's see. Um, Dale, would you read the first one, please? And take your time. Okay. Connect with anything you want to. The fear of redemption. You may wonder why it is so crucial that you look upon your hatred and realize its full extent. You know, I, I have a lot of trouble with that word hatred. I don't, I don't, I don't think like that, or at least I don't think I think like that. Exactly. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. So I, I read this earlier and I got to the first sentence and I started stumbling around. I, so I guess we go on through it. But uh, you may also think that it'd be easy enough for the Holy Spirit to show it to you and to dispel it without the need for you to raise it to awareness yourself if there is one more obstacle you have interposed between yourself and the atonement we have said that no one will countenance fear if he recognizes it yet in your disordered state of mind you are not afraid of fear well this whole first few sentences i i I just, I'm struggling with the idea here that I'm full of hate and fear because I don't think I am. But I think what I need to look at it in a different context of what we're talking about, I guess. Okay, so let me, let me just make a point that because it's only when we're identifying with the ego that what it's saying is true here. Mm -hmm, we sure. also identify with the Holy Spirit. And at that point, there's no fear and hatred. Right, right. But okay, so the the overall picture that we're going to see here is that we have these ego ideals that we're beating ourselves up for. The rules that we made up or rules that we buy into and we feel guilty. And that's to keep us on the level of nonsense. Deeper than that, remember how it talked about the ego's darkest cornerstone is that we are hating when we're identified with the ego. And that's the default program. So it's like the hatred underneath we don't want to look at. And that hatred is self-hatred. And then it gets projected out. But let's just look at self-hatred, which is I, 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 I fell from grace. I'm no longer in the presence of God. I, I, I hate myself. Thoughts like that, below that, is what we're really afraid of. But we, what this section and the last one are saying is you have to look at what you're doing with guilt. You have to look at the hatred that that is hiding and then go below it to the truth. Because those first two layers, ego ideals from last section, the hatred that it's going to talk about here, and what is underneath those first two sections 
our ego stuff. But unless we look at it, unless we say, oh, maybe I've got some hatred. You know, maybe when I'm angry at Timothy for some little thing, it's like, it's really self-hatred because it keeps me from love, right? So it's it's telling us we need to look at it. I, I think we should mention the section before then. Go ahead. So in the section before paragraph three, what it was saying is that you're hiding this fact that you're not as God created you anymore. You're hiding that and you think God's gonna punish you for it. But since you're trying to replace God, you punish yourself. And so like psychology says, you're afraid to look at the darkness. You're afraid to look at all that. And what the course is saying, the reason we don't look deeply in our minds is because part of our mind really realizes we are as God created us. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to, we want to punish ourselves for that because we think God is going to punish us. So mm -hmm. when we experience fear and hatred, we're suffering because of that. But the real real reason we don't look is because part of the mind knows that there's love there right so the punishment the ego so when we're upset in fear and hatred we're just punishing ourselves because we think we owe this debt from separation and that's all ego it's not our true self it's not who we really are uh, i so got i gotta say just one more thing i've read this section for years and it's very hard for me to understand i i looked at it and i didn't know what is it trying to say but the reason it seems hard is because he's approaching our defense systems directly in the deepest way yeah well does that mean if you're not at peace that you're you're hating yourself uh, yes that, well is yeah. that the sim is that the simple take on it i think so uh, that's a good way to say it yeah well, even the slightest to... irritation there's a place where it says even the slightest irritation covers up intense rage or something like that okay well. yeah we don't like to look at that that's the whole point <laughs> okay all right uh sentence six you do not like it but it's not your desire to attack that really frightens you you are not seriously disturbed by your hostility you keep it hidden because you are more afraid of what it covers you could even look upon the ego's darkest cornerstone without fear if you did not believe that without the ego you would find within yourself something you fear even more you are really not afraid of crucifixion your real real terror is of redemption <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, I can tell you that 30 years ago, I got up to a point of study and it, it required that I make, let go, I, as I would identify it now, of the ego and it scared me to death. Right. I mean, it really, I put the stuff away. I just didn't, yeah. this can't be true. Yeah. And while I wanted to, I was really, I mean, and when I say I was frightened, I was frightened of it. Mm -hmm. um, so 30 years later, here we are reading this paragraph, and I guess if there's any progress, at least I have some understanding of what went on all that time ago. Right. Yeah. Redemption. I, mean, I tried I mean, to look last... up, I tried to look up the word redemption in the glossary, mm -hmm. and, and there wasn't anything. Uh, well, okay, so it means restored to your pre to your to your true self. And the crucifixion that it's talking about is our own crucifixion of ourselves. It can be but myself I crucify one of the lessons it's saying. It's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about our pain. Okay. Well, if you look at that last sentence and it says you really you're not really afraid of crucifixion, which means you're not really afraid of the fact that you're suffering. That's another way to say it. What you're really afraid of is redemption. So that's a real heads up when we try and practice forgiveness. Why we're resisting practicing forgiveness is because we're, we're afraid. afraid of love. And and it's just I like mean, think about the mm -hmm. kinds of rela kinds of relationships we resist because we know that they're loving and but we want to we think it's frightening to be loving to this person. Mm -hmm. So, so redemption 
is forgiveness and extending love. You could say that, or you could say it's restoring your, your awareness of who you really are. You know, I, I am as God created me. Okay. Yeah. Let's go on. It'll be, it'll become clearer and you, you'll feel safer. Yeah, it'll be clear as mud, but it'll cover the ground. Kathy, would you read paragraph two, please? Sure. <clears throat> Under the ego's dark foundation is the memory of God. And it is of this that you are really afraid. That's like what, what Dale was just yeah, saying. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that core that's so tender, mm. you know, that's so... I don't know. It's like if anything gets close to it, you know, it's going to hurt it. I don't know if anybody can identify with that. Oh, but yeah. That's what the ego is warning you about. Yeah. Yeah. For this memory would instantly restore you to your proper place. And it is this place that you have sought to leave. Your fear of attack is nothing compared to your fear of love. That's pretty sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, you would be willing, no, so we're afraid all the time. Look at that. Your fear of attack is nothing compared to your fear of love. I mean, what else is there really? Okay. Uh, would you be willing to look even upon your savage wish to kill God's son if you did not believe that it saves you from love? Now let's talk about who God's son really is. Yeah. Okay. For this wish caused the separation. You have protected it because you do not want the separation healed. You realize that by removing the dark cloud that obscures it, your love for your father would impel you to answer his call and leap into heaven. You believe that attack is salvation because it would prevent you from this. For still deeper than the ego's foundation, much stronger than it will ever be, is your intense and burning love of God and his for you. This is what you really want to hide. That's what's underneath all the guilt. All of this stuff, yeah. Time. I saw an article one time where this lady was just absolutely horribly abusive to her baby, two and a half years old. And the police were, it was a picture, and the police were taking the child away. And the kid was reaching for the mom, even though, you know, really, really upset that the mom was going away, even though the mom was really harmful to it. And it's what you know and what we're taught and what we taught ourselves. It's just amazing how we think that's that's a really good example you know it's like that's what the child knew that's what we know ego and it's it's self-attack and it's projected attack on others and we cling to it desperately because we don't because we're afraid of god so i mean just an example of that of why we're afraid, let's say, instead of redemption or atonement, forgiveness, why mm -hmm. we resist forgiveness is that, for instance, you said something to me that's not true, and I want to defend it like that. And the course is saying, well, just forgive her. And I'm going, wait a minute, if I forgive her, her crime will not be recognized. Right? <laughs> so we resist <laughs> forgive. This whole section is giving us such a heads up on what's really going on in our minds when we try and practice forgiveness. Yeah. I, I just love that line that says, your love for your father would impel you to answer his call and leap into heaven, leap into joy, unmitigated love. And then in sentence eight, for still deeper than the ego's foundation and much stronger than it will ever be, is your intense and burning love of God and his for you. That's what we're really afraid of. That's why we have all of these ego ideals to cover up our intense hatred and that whole bag of attack and crucifixion of ourself and other people is just meant to hide our love of God and his for us. Yeah. It was like last week, Dale, when we talked about our children and like I'm worried about my son based on his past behaviors. I'm anxious about his future, right? Mm -hmm. And what, I, what I'm not seeing at that very moment is that as I'm worried about his past, worried about what he'll do in the future, I'm 
I'm avoiding the fact that I can join him right. in forgiveness and a miracle right now and right. realize that since it's the Holy Spirit giving it from me to them, right. it is accomplished. In other words, all of this attack, self-attack, when you're worried about him, that's self-attack. Yeah. Or it could be attack of him if you were on the phone and telling him he's wrong or whatever. All of that is to cover up the real love that's right. that exists. And that's all that's real. That's right. That's yeah. why that last sentence is so profound. This is what you really want to hide right. is how much you love God. Right. And your and the son's name. And I think Kathy had a good clue there too. We th ego counsels us that if you let your heart lead, you're gonna be hurt. That's what the obliterated. Ego <laughs> What's that? Obliterated. Obliterated. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's no little, little, little thing. I woke up the other morning and I was, you know, had this long list of stuff that I was disapproving of. And all of a sudden I realized that my disapproval in this life is really beyond beside the point. And what do I want? What do I want? What is this do disapproval bringing me? Because it was, I was really upset. Yeah. And it's like, I think that they should pay. I think, you know, it's like, I'm trying to influence how other people think and i don't know how they think really and truly you know what i mean, I mean it's just like it's yeah, yeah. so beside the point that it's like almost a useless commodity right. and as up. long as i was able to hang on to that thought i felt really good but then the disapproval came back so <laughs> you know i'm so glad you said that about wanting because that's what the course is saying when you're confused when you don't understand what's going on these are the two questions to ask yourself what do I want and what is its purpose? Mm -hmm. Is its purpose to maintain this illusion of myself or is it a purpose to give me an experience that reminds me of my right. true self? And what do I really want? And uncovering that I want to hide the love mm -hmm. is hard to see. Yeah, because the ego will tell you that attack is love. Mm -hmm. Know that, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm just doing this for your own good. Like, uh, yes. You be punished for what you said to me. Yeah. Then, then, <laughs> then you get straightened out and then you'll be better, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of baloney. All attack is ego. So let's stop there. Any, any further comments or questions on that paragraph? Well, let's have Eric read three and give us your comments, Eric. In honesty, is it not harder for you to say I love than I hate? You associate love with weakness and hatred with strength. And your own real power seems to you as your real weakness. For you could not control your joyous response to the call of love if you heard it. And the whole world you thought you made would vanish. The Holy Spirit then seems to be attacking your fortress, for you would shut out God, and he does not will to be excluded. Wow. The Holy Spirit seems to be attacking your fortress. The, the word fortress is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's really built up um, protection. Yeah. Really yeah. thick walls and, and, and all sorts of strategies. <laughs> to keep to keep out this attacker yeah and the ability to attack from the from the top pour boiling oil <laughs> yeah drawbridge morts anything to, <laughs> yeah and it does feel like that doesn't it um the the mind produces all these strategies yeah. to to keep out the holy spirit um it's saying it's harder for you to say I love than I hate. I mean, that's what that first paragraph saying really, isn't it? That I hate is sort of the default position that this is how we, we automatically um, respond to the Holy Spirit trying yeah. to get through to us. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like weakness because to 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 to, to let the drawbridge down and yeah. and let something in that's going to affect change what you are your whole concept of yourself yeah. is 
it's just terrifying, isn't it? Remember from chapter six, when we read the three lessons of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and the third construct was be vigilant only for God and his kingdom. Right. So when we're looking at the mind, that means I can disregard the fears, the hate, and look just for the miracle. Mm -hmm. Look just for that specific sense of forgiveness in that moment. You know, that is certainly true in that moment. And this section is asking us to reflect on what's motivating us in a deeper level, yeah. right? You know, you don't have to do this every day all the time, but just recognize that we have this, this ego program and ego is fear and hatred. That's what it is. It's like a, an operating system of fear and hatred. Connie, would you read four for us, please? Sure. You have built your whole insane belief system because you think you would be helpless in God's presence and you would save yourself from his love because you think it would crush you into nothingness. You are afraid it would sweep you away from yourself and make you little because you believe that magnitude lies in defiance and that attack is grandeur. It's, it's, all, it's all about protecting me, ego. Ego, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. You think you have made a world God would destroy and by loving him, which you do, you would throw this world away, which you would. Right. <laughs> it's all, I'm all backward thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Therefore, you have used the world to cover your love. And the deeper you go into the blackness of the ego's foundation, the closer you come to the love that is hidden there. And it is this that frightens you. It's like the biggest fear is getting to who I really am. Yeah. Yeah. Just a grammatical point. Look at the, the structure of this paragraph in each of the sentences, except for the last one begins with you. Mm -hmm. And then the last sentence is therefore, which is a logical word that given what we've just said, mm -hmm. this is this is, will be true. You've used the world to cover up. So think about that when I'm thinking about all the social issues or political issues or what my friends did or did not do, mm -hmm. if I can realize I'm hiding something mm -hmm. in that, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm dissociating right. uh, in that and that I'm afraid of love. Right, yeah. That's probably what's going on in the world today. You know, not just ourselves personally, but love is approaching more and more and we're just, going deeper and deeper into the ego's foundation. Yeah. It, it's like, you know, it's like bedrock and then gravel and rocks and all that kind of stuff. And we're, we start out with a little stuff. I, 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 I said something wrong, the ego ideals. I, I'm, I, made a, I made a terrible mistake. I feel so bad. And then deeper than that is the hatred that we feel for ourselves. And we'll see why later on in this section, why we would hate ourselves. Okay, underneath all of that bedrock, there's light. And that's the only thing that there is, is love, truth. The rock is not real, it's an illusion. Hi, Laura, would you, would you like to read paragraph five? Sure. You can accept insanity because you made it but you cannot accept love because you did not. You would rather be a slave of the crucifixion than a son in, of God in redemption. Your individual death seems more valuable than your living oneness for what is given you is not so dear as what you made. You are more afraid of God than of the ego and love cannot enter where it is not welcome, but hatred can for it enters of its own volition and cares not for yours. 
Yeah. So it's, it's, we, we love, or I guess love is we, do they use the word love? Well, um, yeah, you cannot, well, you want what you made. It's kind of, it's kind of like Frankenstein's monster, right? He, he still, he wouldn't, he wouldn't end it, right? Because it's like, ah, oh, but I made this. And I feel like that about my ego, this horrible monster is out of control in the world, making all kinds of terror and, and chaos and, and madness. But it's like, oh, but I made it. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I won't pull it back in. Um, that it, it kind of does resonate. And it's, it's, it kind of fits in this whole explanation of like, I want it to be special. I want it to be different. And so I want to do, I feel like a little three-year-old, I want to do it all by myself. Right, right. <laughs> and I'm stamping my feet down and saying, I want to do, my, you know, even if it's like, you know, I, I burn the pancakes and I set the house on fire, but I did it all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Right on. I always say like a two-year-old, me do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that really does resonate for me I mean as horrible <laughs> as it is when you really look at it and it's why it's so hard to look at things instead of project them I, I'm, I'm for my own self I'm beginning to really see that it's like there's something there's darkness in me or I wouldn't be seeing x out there and it's too scary for me to do that so instead I'm just going to keep making up stories and illusions and go, you know, pretend I'm a knight in shining or slaying dragons or something <laughs> instead mm -hmm. of the truth is letting Holy Spirit heal these dark thoughts or, or the thoughts that cause the darkness in me instead of projecting them. It's like hot potato. <laughs> like, ah, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Yeah. And, and um, well, there was something that you said there that was so helpful. Especially I, I, I lost it. Let's okay. go. Thank you. Thank you. I, yeah. I wanted to comment on something excellent that you said. But... Okay. So, um, Dale, could you read six for us, please? Uh, yes. You must look upon your illusions and not keep them hidden because they do not rest on their own foundation. You must look upon your and not keep them hidden. Does that mean to recognize that, that they are really nothing? Is, is that the perception part of it? Well, first of all, we look at them and then we recognize, you know, and, and in giving them to the Holy Spirit, we can recognize that they're illusions. But we first have, you know, rather, there's this thing called spiritual bypass, which it means, you know, I have, a, I have a, an angry thought, let's say. And I just go like, nope, not me. That's an illusion. And that's spiritual bypass. We have to say, okay, I have that angry thought. I chose anger. Holy Spirit, take it. Um, let's see. In concealment, they appear to do so. And thus, they seem to be self-sustained. This is the fundamental illusion on which the others rest. For beneath them, and concealed as long as they are hidden, is the loving mind that thought it made them in anger. And the pain in the mind is so apparent when it is uncovered that its need of healing cannot be denied. Not all the tricks and games you offer it can heal. It, it can't heal it, for there is the real crucifixion of God's Son. You know, this whole thing, I, I going back to sentence four, the pair you are afraid of God, you are more afraid of God than of the ego, that just really causes me a lot of consternation for some reason. And then this paragraph carries it on. I'd never really thought of that. But I'm the way I'm feeling right now, I, I know it's true, but I don't get why. Yeah, that's you okay. <laughs> uh, well, I guess it is, because you know, I'll have to yeah. process this. But the only thing I can think of is, and again, it's time to let all this stuff go is the foundation I had growing up of a vengeful God and evil God. Right. Uh, uh, 
you, you're going to be punished. And as much as I thought I'd let that stuff go, apparently I haven't. Right. So. Right. You know, the, the why question is really important there because the point of insanity is that there is no reason for it. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and, and when you're in insanity, that's where the confusion, that, that confusion comes in. Mm -hmm. So it, it does tell us in sentence four that we do have a loving mind. Our true self is love. Our true self is an emanation of God, which is love. So that's who we really are. All of this other stuff is stuff we made. It's the world we made. It's the thoughts we made. I know what I was going to comment on. Building on what building on what Laura said, and and that is, we know that we have hatred in our mind when we see hatred in other people. You ever see hatred in other people? It's only a projection. That's only the ego. So if you see it in someone else, it's because it's been projected, and that just shows you the mirror that there is hatred in our mind. We believe in hatred. So rather than look on the split mind, mm -hmm. the ego's thought system, the Holy Spirit's, we make it about the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a defense mechanism. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so any other thoughts on paragraph six? I, If I could just add to um, the conversation, I kind of um, compare it to kind of being in an abusive relationship where you're like, yeah, it's bad. And, you know, but maybe I deserve it. And also it's going to be so scary to go out there and try and change. And I know this person wants to help me, but, and there's yeah. that kind of psychological element that's so woven throughout the whole course. And I think it's so helpful, at least for me, yeah. that is like, I can see that it's like, you're kind of like, but, but it's a familiar pain. But, yes, but I exactly. know this, so it's, even if it's, I know it's not, it's dysfunctional, yeah. but it's, it's mine and it's all I know. And isn't right. that how I learned to, how do I function without that kind not of thing? Exactly. Yeah. Familiar yeah. pain. That's a really important phrase. In that. Yeah. Let's see. I think it was Kathy's turn. Seven. Seven, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet he is not crucified. There is both his pain and his healing for the Holy Spirit's vision is merciful and his remedy is quick. Do not hide suffering from his sight, but bring it gladly to him. Lay before his eternal, his eternal sanity all your hurt and let him heal you. It's like, uh, what does it say? Give the Holy Spirit all your pain this Christmas or something like yeah. that somewhere. Everything that would hurt and humble you. Everything that hurts us. Yeah. yeah. Do not leave any spot or pain hidden from his light. And search your mind carefully for any thoughts you may fear to uncover. For he will heal every little thought you have kept to hurt you and cleanse it of littleness and restore it to the magnitude of God. It's like Laura was saying, where you're in those relationships and you think, well, maybe I deserve this. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that's what's going to keep showing up for you. Yeah. yeah. So now, th this paragraph is one where you can take this to the bank because this is the point of the holy instant in the course. Mm -hmm. Like the holy instant and the holy relationship are the two major functions. And he's promising that if you uncover these deeper senses of guilt, mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit will heal it immediately. Mm -hmm. There's no waiting for you to be healed from that unforgiving thought. His vision is merciful and his remedy is quick. Quick. Yeah. So that gives us this encouragement to look deeper mm -hmm. and give it to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Like I noticed, I, I, I got divorced from the woman I was raising kids with, and it was I had adopted one of the children, and one was a daughter. Was a daughter, and the other day I uncovered some hidden guilt I had mm -hmm. about divorcing and feeling like I abandoned that mm -hmm. child. You mm -hmm. know, but those are the deeper programs that are going on. 
Yeah, right. You know, I'm real deep. I'm unworthy. I'm terrible. I'm not a loving person. I cared more about myself than I. I mean, all of that dynamic sin, you can heal that immediately. Right. But you keep it hidden. As long as we keep it hidden, it can't be healed. Yeah. Yeah. And and then and then not just stop with I'm afraid of the hurt and fear. I'm really afraid of the love. Yeah. Underneath this, when I give it to Holy Spirit, I can experience God's love. And it's only the littleness that can hurt us. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Oh, let's see. I think Eric was next. Could you read eight for us, please? Yep. Beneath all the grandiosity you hold so dear is your real call for help. For you call for love to your father as your father calls you to himself. In that place which you have hidden, you will you will only to unite with the Father in loving remembrance of him. You will find this place of truth as you see it in your brothers. For though they may deceive themselves, like you they long for the grandeur that is in them. And perceiving it, you will welcome it and it will be yours. For grandeur is the right of God's Son and no illusions can satisfy him or save him from what he is. Only his love is real, and he will be content only with his reality. You will find this place of truth as you see it in your brothers. That's what strikes me about that paragraph. I think, um, I feel like I'm, I'm so focused on myself as a, oh, I need to learn the course, I need to whatever. But really, you will find this place of truth as you see it in your brothers. It needs to be a more expansive, um, inclusive. Mm. That's thing. the Christ. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. notice how he's been talking about this dynamic that's within our minds, like you're afraid of this, mm -hmm. you think you're really afraid of hate, but you're really afraid of love. And now he switches mm -hmm. to how will I solve that mm -hmm. by granting it to somebody granting else. Granting it to others. Yeah. That's how I solve it in myself because there are no others. There's just the one Christ. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. ego is, is limitation. It yeah. is lack, right? And, and that's part of its trick, isn't it? To keep yeah. you focused on, on the individual yeah. Rather than encompassing the whole yeah. of the mind. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So how I want to see my brother is how I want to see myself. That's it. Yeah. And that's yeah. how I can see I I can see myself as forgiven if I grant that to another because mm -hmm. there really is no other. <clears throat> Connie, could you read nine, please? Sure. Save him from his illusions that you may accept the magnitude of your father in peace and joy, but exempt no one from your love or you will be hiding a dark place in your mind where the Holy Spirit is not welcome. And thus you will exempt yourself from his healing power for by not offering total love, you will not be healed completely. Healing must be as complete as fear, for love cannot enter where there is one spot of fear to mar its welcome. Well, it's, it's about getting out of me and getting, it's kind of like just letting go of all, all of it and just being being with everybody in peace and love, it's, it's right. challenging. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it, it's amazing. It, it increases with practice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, we, we build on our own motivation. The more we yeah. do it, the happier we are. So then we want to do more of that. And it, it 
it speeds us up. So yeah, and recognizing, the recognizing the fear and the hatred that comes up mm -hmm. and saying, oh, that's, you know, that's not me. That's just whatever. Mm -hmm. Ego coming up automatically. Yes. Right? Yeah. So in nine, in nine two, but exempt no one from your love. So the way the ego gets us to trick, mm -hmm. not to grant forgiveness to them and therefore not to ourselves, is the ego has us focus on their behavior uh -huh. instead of who they really are. Yeah, right. Like, look what this guy is doing. Or what look what said. my partner said. Yeah. It looks at behavior right. instead of looking at the deeper aspects of the mind. Right, right. And that seems to be justifiable when we look at people's behavior when we think that the world we made is what we really want <clears throat> no uh, sometimes it's as if it not sometimes it seems like always the ego is looking for the negative yeah. yes i mean love isn't the first thing that comes up usually it's right. always you know what's wrong or what's missing and whatever Right on. Yeah, there's a place where it says the ego has no no clear cut goals. It only knows what it doesn't like. Right. And that's what it's always feeding us. Look exactly. for the threat. Look for what's wrong. Yeah, that's ego. Yeah. Because after all, if I didn't build my fortress walls, what would happen? I'd be undefended. There would be God. Now, this next couple of paragraphs are talking about what we could call the fall, the, the loss of our sense of who we really are. It's a, kind of an important uh, little bit in the course because, well, it is, we run into it as teachers, we run into these kinds of questions all the time. So paragraph 10, that would be Laura's turn. I would just point out what Kathy said about the littleness yeah. in the sections just before it. And yeah. here he's talking about magnitude. Okay. So that is that's a section coming up where he says littleness and magnitude yeah. are your two choices. Right. And when you see them as your two choices, you'll realize how powerful your decision is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one another one of my favorite sections. Okay. Laura, could you read 10, please? Okay. You who prefer separation to sanity cannot obtain it in your right mind. You were at peace until you asked for special favor. And God did not give it for the request was alien to him. And you could not ask this of a father who truly loved his son. Therefore, you made of him an unloving father demanding of him what only such a father could give. And the peace of God's son was shattered, for he no longer understood his father. He feared what he had made, but still more he did fear, fear his real father, having attacked his own glorious equality with him. So just clarification on the first sentence, I think that it refers to sanity. You who prefer separation to sanity cannot obtain sanity. No, cannot obtain it in your, so I'm obtain sorry. the separation. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And, and you could also put in their specialness. Yeah, because mm. that's what he's gonna pick up in paragraph 12. Um, yeah, just a little bit um, about what we requested, the special favor. I mean, I think it's, again, just to be special and different yes. and to come into form, I mean, which we didn't understand, I'm sure, um, is a, such a limitation of everything that we really are. And so I don't think we understood what we were asking, but why... God would not grant it, as I understand this paragraph anyway. Um, and I, I think it's just because as the same God material, we, we, 
we can't really be defined or experienced truly in form. I think this is just by virtue of being in form here, we are not able to experience truly what we are. I mean, there's the forgiven world, so right, it gets closer. But mm -hmm. think, until we're back to knowledge, I don't think we can really experience all the glory that it just talked about, right? We can learn it, and I think we kind of gradually, right, go from unforgiven world to forgiven world to happy dream. But and that's I, enough. And that's enough, right? Because then God has to do the final step with with the knowledge piece, right? Yeah. The truth. Yeah. Right. And, I, and I, that's I, what he's saying about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a form of love's formlessness. Right. And it's us who has to make that decision. Right. And and we made form, yes, but the Holy Spirit can use it. So we don't want to pathologize it. But what this is telling us, I think this is the Adam and Eve story, in a sense. This is saying that we, we said to God, make me special. Because if you look at the what is the Christ section, yeah you'll see that there are aspects of the Christ and we, we are aspects. Our spirit is an aspect. We're like a facet of a jewel. So we, we were in some sense a being, a part of the being enough to say, I wanna be separate. I wanna be special. Do you agree with this interpretation? Well, if you go back, yes. If, if you go back to the Adam and Eve story, remember what it was said about Adam. Mm -hmm. Adam had the ability of, seemingly had the ability of naming, yeah. which means concepts. Yeah. And that's how we break the oneness. Right. Because we make up concepts. Right. Where there is really only one idea, and that is God. What? Yeah. yeah. So you know, that, that's how we fragment. Mm -hmm. We fragment the oneness, and the same thing is is like um, we just isolate concepts like death, mm -hmm. and then we get confused about it. That may be obscure. I don't know. In the um, there's a section called the forgiveness of specialness. Yes, uh -huh. I was reading that, and it seems like it's saying you asked God. For you to be special yes um and he and he said no you can't be special you're part of oneness yes um so then you had a bit of a tantrum and um you created your own illusion of specialness yes you know you can't really be outside the oneness you're in with god but you've created this illusion so you've got to forgive god for not allowing you to be special mm -hmm. and then you've got to forgive yourself for creating an illusion of being special so it's like mm -hmm. a two, seems like a two elements to it. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, and the only way we could be special is to create the illusion of pain. That's it. Pain is the absence of God. So it's like uh, you know, there's there's water. There's water is like one, and it flows around, and that's more like what we are. And we wanted to put what, like ice cube tray separation in there. And it's like, we try to make ourselves separate, but we have to do it with not God, with not love, with hatred, with, with lack, with loss, with pain. You know, it, I don't know if this would be helpful for you, but when we did our first study with Robert Perry, another word for specialness is specificity. And that's a real key to looking at how you can accomplish forgiveness in your mind, because unforgiveness is always a very specific, specific context. That's interesting. And the answer to a very specific context is forgiveness in some form the mind can recognize as an expression of love. That's interesting. So specificity, when we're upset, that's when we're hurt, when we're in this obscurity of that is to look at the specific incidents of unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. So there's something, and it's like recognizing the guilt I felt by getting divorced and thinking I abandoned my children. There's something very specific in the mind. Mm -hmm. that, and that's why the looking is so important. Right. 
and recognizing there's this defense mechanism that says, oh, you're afraid of the fear and the hate, but I'm really afraid of the love. Of love that's and if we understand you. that we're afraid of the love, then we're open to forgiveness. That's it. Huh. I think it's Dale's turn again, is it? Wait, who read that last one? Laura. Yeah, Dale is next, please. Number 11. Okay. In peace, he needed nothing and asked for nothing. In war, he demanded everything and found nothing. For how could the gentleness of love respond to his demands except by departing in peace and returning to the Father? If the Son did not wish to remain in peace, he could not remain at all. Uh, that sentence. Um, it seems to me it's real important uh, of trying to to stay in that place where we see the world but don't interact with it. Uh, we talked last week about kind of becoming a, an observer mm -hmm. and and learning to. Well, there's a little little thing happened this morning that was nothing. There was a choice where we could make it something or make it nothing, and the choice was to make it nothing. It was a very simple thing. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, that's what I'm at least trying to do now is to discern things that, well, really, none of it's, none of it is, regardless of the magnitude of appearance, it's really nothing. Yeah. yeah. And, and that has, I'm working on it. But it's still tough, and and the way I'm I'm trying to learn to handle that is just to look at the appearance. If it's a person, regardless of what's going on, and say, look, that's as the truth of that person is that's how God created them, and they're 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 divine in nature, regardless of what what's appearing. Yeah, yeah. That because makes sense. Any, the hard part is to recognize that. Whatever I'm seeing that's bad, evil, lacking, whatever, is a projection of my belief about myself. You know, I've heard that for years, but I really <laughs> struggle with that. Well, and I, I'm not that. saying it's not true. And this, this whole last two weeks have dredged up a lot of stuff, but I'll think a lot about that. I've heard it for years, and it must be true, or I wouldn't have recognized it. Mm, see, yeah, see that? Because the truth is in you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've been looking at this research lately in the last 10 to 15 years, psychological research that says there's this negativity bias in your mind. That's ego. Yeah. But what it's saying is you, you can see all of these wonderful things about somebody else or yourself, but the ego is getting you to look at the one thing that's wrong. Yeah. That's a negativity bias that the mind has. Yeah. And if we understand that, it would be much easier to see what's really going on in the mind. It's like, you know, be vigilant only for God in his kingdom. Right. So the, the, the idea comes up in my mind that, you know, it's like your car is always pulling over to the right. So you can't just be like neutral with your hands on the steering wheel like this. You got to constantly be turning to the left, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you just be vigilant for the truth in yourself because the ego is always trying to pull you off the road. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for a darkened mind cannot live in the light and it must seek a place of darkness where it can believe it is where it is not. God did not allow this to happen, yet you demanded that it happen and therefore believed that it was so. Um, okay, well, this stuff's all unconscious because I, I, you yeah, know, it is just all unconscious. I, yeah, it is. And, and it is telling us what is in our unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. But the more we look, the more conscious it becomes. And it's like, the more we look and give it to the Holy Spirit and dispel that little thing, the more we do that, it's like that example that you give so often of you got a glass full of inky water and you 
pour more clear water into it, pour more water. It, it, the first thing out is the black. As the darkness. And then finally, you've got nothing but light. So the light can dispel the darkness. And what that means is um, by looking, by bringing the light to what is unconscious, when you get a little clue about it, bring the light in, bring that up to the Holy Spirit, give it to the Holy Spirit, and it becomes conscious and you got nothing left but love. And it's really important though, that that's why the concept of a split mind is so important because what he's saying about the fear and the hatred and the attraction, that's only true when we're identifying with the ego. Right. When we identify with the Holy Spirit and atonement and forgiveness, this isn't true. Right. I think that's why the last section was about ego ideals. You know, the, the rules that we make up about how I should act and how you should act how things should be, that whole set of rules and regulations that we have made up, those ego ideals are where you can begin to get a hold of what the deeper story is. So you have a little annoyance with a brother. That's, that thought is what we give to the Holy Spirit. Right. Little yeah. by little. And I mean, even now, as I speak about it, this guilt I feel because I feel like through divorce, I abandoned my children, when really it's saying the real issue is I think I abandoned God yeah. and the truth. Yeah. And, and the only way that that can be solved is not on the analytical level. The only way you can see the truth of that is to choose forgiveness and get the peace that immediately comes, mm -hmm. the contentment that comes from forgiveness. Right. Nothing needs to happen, so I'm okay. You're okay just the way you are. Yeah. So let's look at this next, this last paragraph. Are, any other comments on this one? Paragraph 11. I was just going to say, um, you know, going back to what Tim said about research and the brain, it, um, there's also... There's also this thing called unconscious bias right. that, that that's basically the same thing as not looking at our ego. I mean, it, it, it's easy to, to see it in things that don't matter, right. but yeah. it, it's really sometimes difficult to tease it out in, in things that are so much a part of who we are. Right? Absolutely. You know how the, the beginning of the workbook I think it's where this is. It says um, you learn things in, in little by little by little until you can generalize. And then, you know, the problem is gone, basically. Yeah. And I think that's what this is. So we forgive the little things. We forgive the little things. And then by looking at, oh, it wasn't what she did. It was what I was thinking and my reaction and so on about this little thing like, putting too much salt in the in the soup or something and it's like forgive those little tiny things and sooner or later we begin to have an awareness of oh I want to attack and oh my attack of other people is really an attack on myself why would I hate myself like that why would I keep myself away from God so little by little in this last paragraph, singling out. Hang up uh, before we move on. Okay. Um, sentence five. Um, For a darkened mind cannot live in the light, and it must seek a place of darkness where it can believe it is where it is not. I haven't found it yet, but there's a section later in the text, much later, that says, don't say you can't learn this course because mm -hmm. you've taught yourself you're not who you really are. Mm -hmm. And you've taught yourself that your thoughts are not really coming from you. Mm -hmm. So don't say you can't learn this course because what you've taught yourself is incredible. Right. I'm yeah. not who I am. Right. How could I not be who I am? I mean, yeah. that, that doesn't make any sense. So, you know, the bottom line of this thing is you are not your ego. Yeah. But unless you look at the ego, 
and not just the little tip of the iceberg, but you know, you shave off the top of the iceberg, the iceberg rises a little more. You shave off the top of that, it rises a little more. You got to do the work and recognize that that is not you. That iceberg is not you. The ego is not you. And when the Course is saying that, what you mentioned about generalizing, mm -hmm. that's true of all kinds of learning. Yeah, sure. Like if you're doing experiments, this came yeah. out this way. Now it came out, it keeps coming out the same way and you learn to generalize it. Right. Okay, let's see. That was Dale. So then the next one I think would be Eric. Um, that idea of singling out in this first paragraph is the same as the separation or the specialness. Yeah. Yeah. So is it Eric's turn? Yeah. Okay. okay, I can read. Go for it. To single out is to make alone and thus make lonely. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, the idea of specialness, if you consider it as singling out and making yourself alone, it's suddenly not quite as attractive, is it? <laughs> <laughs> You're right on. Yeah. Um, God did not do this to you. Could he set you apart knowing that your peace lies in his oneness? No. He denied you only your request for pain, for suffering is not of his creation. Hmm. Having given you creation, he could not take it from you. He could but answer your insane request with a sane answer that would abide with you in your insanity. And this he did. No one who hears his answer but will give up insanity. For his answer is the reference point beyond the illusions from which you can look back on them and see them as insane. But seek this place and you will find it. For love is in you and will lead you there. Um, I assume he's talking about the Holy Spirit here, about... Um, answering your insane request with a sane answer yeah, I thought so. that would abide with you in your insanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I liked what he said. Um, he denied you only your request for pain for suffering is not of his creation. So it's like saying, I want to be special. I want to suffer. But yeah. Why would he agree to that? Yeah, right. <laughs> And that's why the ego is not real. He didn't, he didn't allow this belief to be real. It's like a dream. It's an illusion. But since we feel it so strongly, emotionally, we think it's really real. And when we're in that place of emotional pain or physical pain, we just don't remember God. I like what he said too, Eric said about, you know, specialness doesn't look so great when it'll only make you lonely yeah. in the ego's hands. Right. But that's why giving it to the Holy Spirit is so important because he said, you want specialness? Great, here's your special function. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is a very specific act in your mind. Yeah. Very specific. Yeah. That first sentence to single out is to make a loan. It reminded me of the uh, two lessons this week was uh, the see the name of God is my inheritance and I call on the name of God and on my own where you're every name you're giving is dividing stuff up. Yeah, and this is yeah. how we have learned to deal with the world. We cut things out, you know, that was unity before we make things that aren't there. Just be, the way that we define our world is separation. Yeah. And I just thought that was... We're doing it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty continuous. I mean, it that's, is. So, that's so important to see the first purpose of language, which means concept, mm -hmm. was to make separation real yeah. by dividing up the oneness. Yeah. And in Christianity, uh, God, God gave Adam the right to name all the creatures. Yeah. Right. So in Christianity, the idea is separation right from the get-go, too. Right from the get-go. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the belief in... I mean, right there in Genesis is the belief that God is a meanie, you know, 
for <laughs> gives it gives rules the, the little people do the wrong thing so they are punished forever god is a big meanie in the original testament but look at i'd like to leave you with this thought from paragraph two sentence eight for still deeper than the ego's foundation and much stronger than it will ever be is your intense and burning love of God and his for you. So before we leave, could we do a practice with today's lesson? If you would join me in quiet um, and I will read today's lesson and we can spend a quiet moment with it. So today's lesson, I'm not a body. I am free for I'm still as God created me. I want the peace of God. The peace of God is everything I want. The peace of God is my one goal, the aim of all my living here, the end I seek, my purpose and my function and my life while I abide where I am not at home. I am not a body. I am free for I'm still as God created me. Amen. Thank me, you so much. Let me stop. This I record. love sharing this one with you. Let me stop the recording.